welcome to church this morning. Welcome to a brand new year. This is my first weekend back at the church for a couple of weeks, um, having a little bit of a break. And there are obviously still lots of people who are still enjoying the lovely weather we're having at the moment. Um, I'm, not, I'm determined not to lose that. I lost it earlier. Um, what was I saying? I was saying hello, wasn't I? Hello to all those people on the live stream as well and uh, watching this uh, later on YouTube as well. We thank you for joining us. Um, I like to um, every now and then give little updates on what's happening with our social media. Just recently on Facebook, we have gone over 1,500 followers on Facebook. I think about 1,520 followers, which is pretty good, I think. We're reaching those number of people. And, if they, and some of those people, they share what we post. So it's reaching more and more people. So that's a fantastic thing that we can reach people in, in that medium. I love that, um, that video. I don't know whether Roderick chose that video specifically because of the songs I've chosen or what I was thinking in my head, which he didn't know, lucky fella. Um, but it just fits in so well about Thanksgiving and, and worship. That's what I wanted to start this year off in our first really formal worship session uh, today. So I'm going to read some verses why I've got my glasses. This is from Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. I thought they were fantastic um, words to start a new year. And I want to start this new year in praising and lifting God's name up on high. So I invite you to stand as we sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Let's sing together. Lord, I lift your name on high. So glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. my glasses back on, get my phone back out. Some, verse, some other verses from Philippians, this time from chapter 2. And this time we're going to start at verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, 
God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're going to sing, Here I am to worship. That's why we're here. We're going to bow the knee. If you want to do that literally, that's quite all right. I'm not going to do that literally because I've got a dodgy knee. But in my heart, I'm going to be bowing my knee before our God. I don't, because I can guarantee within a couple of days this is out the window. But each year, at the start of each year, I, I try and work out what what can I see f- coming forward. What 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 do I see happening this year? Um, and I know that's a silly thing to do sometimes, but that's just me. Um, I read some words the other day, which were fantastic, and I think they really apply for us at the start of a new year, looking forward. And it says this, those who leave everything in God's hands will soon see God's hands in everything. 
I'll read that again. Those who leave everything in God's hands will soon see God's hands in everything. And I think that's a great reminder to each one of us just to leave this year, next week, tomorrow, the next 10 minutes in God's hands. fully invested in our lives, that you are so aware of what is going on each moment of our lives. You know the future. Whatever the future holds, Lord, we are in your hands and we are so grateful. But Lord, it takes effort on our part to put your, ourselves and our lives in your control. Lord, we are so often we want to take that control back and say, oh, I can do this bit, I can do this bit. But Lord, we just acknowledge that the best way is for you to have complete and utter control of our lives. And so, Lord, as we meet together here for worship, the start of this new year, Lord, not knowing what is to come, Lord, we again acknowledge you as the supreme being, as the leader and forgiver of each of our lives. And if that's not the case, Lord, I just pray that you, once again we would put our lives in your hands, that we'd surrender completely to you. Lord, I just pray for all the things that happen in this service, Lord, that your spirit would continue to be here amongst us, working amongst us, speaking to our hearts. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see uh, you all here today. And it's great to be back, of course, uh, though 
I don't know why I make my first day back at work a Sunday. I did the same last year. I was sitting there during the week and thought, I've actually got to get some stuff ready for, for Sunday. But anyway, I'll try and get myself a bit more organised, perhaps to next year. I don't know if I've got any funny stories from when I was away, but uh, I did learn that it is possible to uh, shrink Crocs and other similar shoes. I didn't think it would be possible to do that. I bought them back a different way, just on top of a crate under a plastic lid, and Monday was a very warm day, so when I got back and got them out, I thought, they don't look right. They look smaller. So I tried to get mine on my feet, but they cut off my circulation after 10 minutes, and I looked at Kelly's, and I thought, I know Kelly's feet aren't that big, but their feet are bigger than that, so... Crocs aren't that dear to replace, but Shimano fishing shoes, so that was a little bit of a lesson for me. But anyway, if that's the worst that 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 happened, it wasn't too bad, was it? Uh, So just uh, one announcement today. Uh, Don't forget about Sunday the 12th of February when we have the uh, live screening from Perth of the opening of the memorial to the SS Minor Brook tragedy uh, from World War II there. Uh, So that's be screening from uh, Apple Cross in Western Australia. Uh, so following our service on that day, we're going to be sharing at a barbecue lunch uh, at 11.30 on that day, and then um, activities get away at 12.30 and uh, at 1.10pm the live screening will take place. So if you are intending to come along, uh, we, we do just ask if you can register on Eventbrite. Tickets are free, but just for catering purposes and uh, just logistics of seating and that, we ask that you do register. Uh, the event's on the Facebook page, there's a poster at the back with that registration link. Uh, So I think you've got to the week before to do that if you haven't yet done so. Some exciting news. I won't give it all away, but you might want to have a um, a chat with Kevin Jude afterwards. I think they might have become grandparents last night. So I'll leave the name and the weight and everything for um, for them to share with you. So congratulations, and of course, to uh, Casey and... um, Spencer. Yes, Casey and Spencer. I'm not good with names. Casey and Spencer. It's, that's wonderful news for them and their family. And also, uh, just a welcome to Captain the Real Unicum. Uh, so she has uh, arrived here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, she's been appointed to a divisional role as the Children's Secretary for the State and is the Faith Development Secretary as well, which is a new role around every division. Uh, so we give you a very warm welcome. She's based here in Launceston. A divisional role based in Launceston, hey? Woohoo! That's an achievement in itself. But a very warm welcome, and uh, it's great to have you with us today, and we look forward to getting to know you more uh, in the weeks and months ahead. We'll uh, now continue in worship as we share in our giving of our tithes and our offerings. Thank you, Meredith. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you because we acknowledge that all blessings come from you. And some of those are material blessings. And Heavenly Father, you task us as part of our worship to you, as part of our service for you, to give back some of that which you have given to us. And we've done that today, Father. There are many that give during the week through their time and their talents. And even today, some giving of their time and their talents to worship you. And today we would ask that you would take these offerings that we've given, that they would be used for the extension of your kingdom, for the relief of suffering and for the delivery of salvation where we can. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. is going to bring us a scripture reading, but uh, what I forgot to say just a moment ago is um, it's going to be some time for testimonies. So I've now cut your think time only down to about a minute because it's a short scripture reading, but after we share this, if anyone has a word of testimony today, uh, what God has been doing and or showing you already in this new year, then there'll be that opportunity. Thanks, Anita. And the reading this morning comes from Luke 18, verses 35 to 43. A blind beggar receives his sight. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. May he bless his reading this morning. So, that opportunity for testimony. Don't all stand up at once. Rush to the front. Don't make me fish. I've just been doing that for two weeks. <laughs> there must be someone with a word of praise for the Lord this morning. Come on. Thanks, Warren. Well, I'm sure there's many challenges that pass our way. And um, my challenge this year was to get on holidays without thinking about work because there was an awful lot going on. And um, I praise the Lord because while I was away, there was some um, good family around me. There was good um, friends. We had a chance to catch up with extended family and other friends that we hadn't seen in some time. And I was surprised at the number of people that contacted me through social media, even, um, just to, to talk about how Christmas had gone and the new year, to take my mind off things of work. So I actually came back to work, even though I'd had a bout of COVID and a few other things, came back to work quite refreshed. And um, I think when we lay ourselves be before the Lord and we give over to the Holy Spirit's leading, that's when those times of refreshment come. So I would encourage you to rest in the Lord. Be in his hands. Mm. You can testify at any age. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone uh, for having Logan here this morning. We've had him for the whole weekend and it's just been an absolute blessing. 
because we don't see him very often anymore. So it's just wonderful. And a big smile comes over his face every does, time he yeah. comes to our house. And he loves the boys at home and anybody now. And he's into everything. <laughs> Now, the blessing of family is very precious, isn't it? Someone else with a word. I see Ian coming. Thank you, Ian. Well, uh, along with the family, I enjoyed uh, a week or so away at uh, Alveston, uh, first week in the new year, and we enjoyed the beach and uh, a few other places, Boat Harbour and um, uh, not Luffy Falls, what was it? Mm -hmm. Leave and Canyon. Canyon, yeah, I knew it started with L. <laughs> Uh, and Karen and I explored at Kaydale Lodge. But the, the first Sunday I joined with the people at Alveston and, and that was a good time. And then the second Sunday I went to Devonport and uh, enjoyed the meeting there with Dave and his uh, congregation. And uh, so it was good to, to join with people. And uh, my testimony is the same as it, it is, uh, that I'm a sinner saved by grace. Um, I think of that uh, bumper sticker, you know, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And uh, that's a great source of comfort and strength to me, to know that I've forgiven of all the stupid things I've done in my life. And uh, my age is quite a list of them. But I give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his presence. Trade one Ian for another. <laughs> no, where's, where's the other Ian? We can have a, a tr trilogy. Anyway, look, uh, um, I was blessed uh, dur during the week of having having a visit by by a, a lady and a husband that uh, I'm an honorary uncle to because um, I spent some time boarding with them when I was studying architecture with, with their dad. Uh, when, when they were sort of preschoolers and toddlers and uh, used to spoil them as you, you know, I, I had a bit of grandparenting practice <laughs> with these uh, three children and uh, there are so many things that um, they remind me of each time we catch up, things that I've totally forgotten about and, uh, uh, and it, was, it was interesting the comment that Angela made, she said, said I think eternity is going to be like this, we'll be surprised by all the memories that other people will bring back, the things that we've forgotten about, where we've touched other people's lives. And, uh, and I thought that it was a real encouragement that just in our everyday, you know, going about doing our ordinary things, the little touches of love that we spread with other people, um, perhaps we don't put a lot of value on them or a lot of importance. We, you know, they're part of just living. And we perhaps think, you know, the big things in life are the important things, but... But I think all these little things are going to be surprises. And so I thank you. Thank God for, the, for that reminder and that encouragement that um, just to keep on, keep on loving people every day in our everyday activities. Yeah. Bless others. Thank you. So I say, final opportunity. I see Paul on the way. Yeah. I don't know about you, but it's great to know that God absolutely stands behind his promises. We've got some very dear friends who are actually intercessors for us in our Aussie PG role. Very, very good friends. And they just texted us the other day. And I want to share her testimony because this is, a, this is just an example of our God. This was just last week. I just fell asleep at the wheel on the way home. I was on the back road between Campbelltown and Cressy and I ended up on the wrong side of the road next to a guidepost. Hit that, went out of control, was calling out Jesus, 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 whilst going all over the place. Eventually it came straight. 
I pulled over and my husband came along behind. He was about one, um, one kilometre dis uh, distance away. He stopped to see if, any, if everything was OK. Checked the car. There was no damage and I wasn't injured. And soon after that, a whole lot of big trucks went whizzing past. And, you know, she's a lovely, faith-filled person, or both of them are, and we often share about how important it is to claim God's promises. And one of them is, of course, Psalm 91, where he promises that he will look after us, he will give us long life. And that is just another example. We've heard so many beautiful testimonies of people that God has grabbed and rescued in very dangerous situations. And that was obviously one of them. So I praise God this morning that we can rely on him and rely on his promises. They are true. Thank you. What a mighty and good God we serve, hey? And he blesses us day by day. Invite the worship team back up. Thank you. In thinking about songs for this morning, this one jumped into my mind. Beginning of a new year and how I wanted to start with us really getting down and worshipping God. And this just reminds us that we need to worship. Worship isn't necessarily what we do here on a Sunday either. It's not necessarily singing a song. It's not necessarily reading the scriptures. Worship should be every part of our lives. Everything we, need, we do should be worship to God. So I invite you to stand and sing us, with us this song. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. Song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all. Sorry, Lord, for the things I've made you. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Can you endless no one could express how much you deserve. Jesus, it is all about you. And as Roderick comes to bring your message for today, may we remember that it is all about you. More, all about seeing more of your love for us, seeing more of your plan for our lives, just being in love with you more and more. Amen.
Well, it's hard to believe we're already two weeks into the new year, isn't it? Do you know it's only 84 days to Easter Sunday today, 12 weeks? <laughs> we should know that, though. Hot cross buns are out already, though. People, let's not go there. You know, when each new year rolls around, I think as Jason shared before, I think it always presents that opportunity to reflect a little more than normal. You know, whatever our age, we consider what the year ahead might be about to bring, what we might want to see, what we've done, what we might want to experience or accomplish. We think about what might be needed to bring about the changes that we wish to see happen. I'd like to share some thoughts around this today. So preparing this week, I just thought, can I just do something easy or flog something from somewhere? But that's not how the spirit rolled with me this week, I'm sorry. But first, in the passage we read earlier from Luke 18, 35 to 43, a blind beggar who was not named in the account from Luke, but who we know to be Bartimaeus from the parallel account in Mark 10, encounters Jesus as he approaches Jericho. Now, it's an iconic moment that displays one of Jesus' miraculous healings. But not before Jesus asks this man an important question. So picture the scene. I'm sure you have before when you've heard this preach. There is this blind man, Bartimaeus, or maybe even two blind men if we take the account of the healing from Matthew 20, begging on the side of the road, most likely their usual begging spot. Suddenly there's a commotion, a crowd swirling around and past him, much more people than normal going past so the blind beggar asks people in the crowd, what is going on? And he's told, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So this blind man then starts to call out to Jesus, yelling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, to rise above all the other noise of the crowd and get the attention of Jesus. The crowd rebukes him. You know, why would Jesus be bothered by someone as insignificant as this blind beggar? But even though people try to shut him down, yet still he cries even more louder and more courageously over all that noise and discouragement. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus hears this cry. He stops. You can imagine a hush coming over the crowd all of a sudden, can't you? And request that this blind man be brought to him. And then Jesus asks him a question. In verse 41, a question that's recorded in exactly the same way in each of the accounts from Luke, Mark and Matthew. What do you want me to do for you? Now, at first glance, it might seem a little strange that Jesus asks this. Surely it should be obvious what this man wants, even before he asks. Jesus has healed many other people at this point in his, in his ministry when this man appears before him. And Jesus already knew he was blind. He asked for the man to be brought to him. He knew he couldn't come on his own. And it would have been obvious just by looking at him that he was a beggar. He was most likely not well kept, likely struggling with self-confidence, giving his circumstances, having been dismissed and ignored all his life, never had the opportunity to learn a trade or a vocation. And in front of the crowd of people, Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, the blind beggar replies. And so Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately the blind beggar received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. You know, even before Jesus asked the question, Jesus knew that what the beggar wanted was for his physical situation to change. But Jesus asked the question to test the heart of the matter, this man's faith. In asking, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus wanted the crowd to see this man believe that he was the son of God so they could understand the connection between faith and healing. Or well, they could understand the connection between faith and God granting any request. No matter how embarrassing or shameful it may have been for him to shout over this crowd to get Jesus' attention, when Jesus gauged the depth of his faith and granted his request, his whole focus of life changed. He immediately began to follow Jesus and to influence others around him. And today we continue to remember and celebrate the courage and faith that through Jesus' divine healing led to the transformation of this man's life. You know, if we try and place ourselves into the shoes of this blind beggar, 
I wonder if we would have done what he did. Would our faith have been such that we would have vocally put ourselves out there amongst the crowd and shout out to Jesus, who we believe to be the Messiah, to change my situation completely? Or would we have been more timid and held back and missed the opportunity for Jesus to ask us that question? Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? You know, the story is not the only time in the Gospel accounts Jesus asks such a question. So I think from that we can infer that Jesus often prompted people with such a question in many different circumstances and situations. What do you want me to do for you? If we look at the question a little closer from the original language, language it transliterates most closely as what to you desire you I shall do. That's a little bit of a mouthful, I know, but I think you get the gist of it. And if we look at the two key phrases in that, the first one, desire you, means wanting what is best because someone is ready and willing to act. The desire is an expression of faith in the one who is ready and willing to act. And I shall do is simply to make happen and to cause. So in essence, with this question, Jesus is stating, I am ready and willing to act. Is your faith in me such that whatever you wish to occur, what you wish to see caused or made happen will actually be? Did not Jesus also say, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son? John 14, 13. So this is the realisation that Jesus brings with the question, what do you want me to do for you? There are certain things we need to have done for us that we are incapable of doing ourselves. And the Lord Jesus Christ is well able and perfectly willing to do these things for us, to meet the needs that we are incapable of meeting. Indeed, to meet the needs that we have that no one else is capable of meeting. Forgiveness, salvation, restoration, holiness, sanctification, spiritual freedom. But it's not just the big ticket needs, or the foundational truths of the gospel story. It's also the needs that each of us have and are incapable of meaning for how God has created each one of us and how he equips us for the particular work within the the kingdom of God that he has given us. And whether or not our need is met depends upon one thing, our willingness to receive what the Lord offers to us. And how do we receive what is offered to us? We receive by faith. Now I said earlier that a new year provides a good opportunity to reflect, perhaps reset some things. And I also think this question Jesus asks of people, what do you want me to do for you? Sets a perfect context for such reflection. It is of course a personal question. It was directed to an individual in the story we've considered today. It's also a question that can be considered more corporately. On one of the other occasions, Jesus directed it to both James and John when they said, grant us that one may sit on your left and your right. He told them they don't know what they're asking. It can be asked more corporately. You know, as a family, as a community of faith, united together through the Spirit of God. A collective sense in that Jesus asks of us, what do you want me to do for you? You know, my reflections for this year ahead started a little earlier than normal, which is unusual for me, around September last year. As I began thinking about heading into my eighth year as a Corps officer, I can't believe it's eight years already. Hopefully there's not too many out there thinking, oh, no, it's been eight years. Eight, eight long years, I know. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm still here. But anyway, as I was thinking about heading into 2023, there was an awareness that came through the spirit that I need to lead differently. I need to lead differently for things to be sustainable, both physically and spiritually. You know, God is at work amongst us. Do you believe that? We've testified that to that today, haven't we? I do. I see it. I feel it in the spirit. There are many good things happening throughout this place and through our work as the Salvation Army in our community of Launceston. But so often I do feel stuck in the um, 
maintenance machine of the Salvation Army, so to speak, stuck in the operational mode of keeping things running. So drawn away too frequently from the strategic and planning side of things, being able to spend the time needed to see the bigger picture and the connections of, you know, that God is willing us to see. Now, I'm not being downcast, not being disparaging on myself in saying these things. It's that analytical mind that always is ticking over and that usually takes a couple of hours to get to sleep each night. You know that's me. Of the things that need to change, if the change that I desire to see, then that's both for me and for us as a family of faith, will start to trickle and then flow and become a raging torrent. For as I answer Jesus' question of what do you want me to do for you at this moment in time, at the start of a new year, I respond that I want to see the growth of the kingdom of God come through the ministry of our faith community. I would say that I desire to see an ever-deepening spiritual maturity, both for each individual and together as a family of faith. I would say that I yearn for our faith community to be increasing and expanding influence across all parts of our city and its people for the transforming and life-changing truth of the gospel story and the salvation and restoration it reveals. Lord, I want you to usher in the fullness of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I could go on. You know, I've got to hear sometimes, probably often I get a little bit frustrated. For I see and sense a grand vision of what God desires for us. You know, the kingdom influence he is calling us to be. And most of those statements I've just given, they're not overly specific in one sense, but they're more big picture, they're more visionary things for the kingdom of God. But there seems to be little progress at times we see and experience in in working towards them. So I ask, do I not have enough faith? Do we not have enough faith? You know, I actually don't think it is that. You know, with every part of my being, I have a deep confidence and am convinced of the promises of Scripture, such as Ephesians 3.20. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is is at work within us. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that. And I'm confident, I actually know, there are many here who would also say the same. They are fully convinced of such truths and of the promises of God. As we know, we now have our national vision and mission statements which help guide and direct our service and mission. So our vision statement, wherever there is hardship or injustice, salvos will live, love and fight alongside others to transform Australia one life at a time with the love of Jesus. We have our mission statement, the Salvation Army is a Christian movement dedicated to sharing the love of Jesus by caring for people, creating faith pathways, building healthy communities, working for justice. We have our organisational values also, that we are people who show integrity, compassion, respect, diversity, collaboration, guiding who we are as the Salvation Army people of God. So with all that, I'm reluctant to add too much more to the vision type statements if you like or retention just becomes too much and a bit meaningless. However, there were three phrases that came to me as I dwelt with the prompting of the Spirit from that September period onwards as to what will it mean to lead differently. And these three phrases, I hope, will help set some focus for the year ahead, maybe even longer. And what I found interesting, or interesting to me, hopefully others find it interesting, I don't know, is that after sensing these three phrases, it came with a prompting that I need to lead apostolically. Now, I didn't know quite what that meant, and I still don't really. I'm working that out. But in looking that further only this week, I've discovered that what people would perhaps describe as the three main aspects of apostolic leadership linked in with the three phrases that were received rather neatly. God is always multiple steps ahead of us. Hey, we shouldn't be surprised at that. Now, an apostle, of course, is one who is sent and equips and trains others to be sent. Not necessarily to the other side of the world. It can be equipped and trained to be sent to the community in which they live right here in Launceston. Now, maybe you're thinking there's no way you could minister and serve apostolically. But a call to apostolic leadership is not just a call God makes the church ministers. 
It's not just a call he makes to Salvation Army Corps officers. So I know a call to lead in this way applies to more people listening in the room today than just myself. You may be uncertain when you hear some of this, but never forget the first 12 disciples or the first 12 apostles were all untrained, uneducated men when they first encountered Jesus. But through the scripture and the transformation of Jesus, we see what they became. So leading apostolically. Apostolic leaders are trainers. They help shape each living stone to fit into the house they are building. Like spiritual parents, they raise sons and daughters into fruitful maturity in Christ. And the first phrase that I sense for how we need to focus for this year ahead is be faithful in teaching. Do not forsake teaching. Now, Michael Brodier tells of an experience of growing up in San Francisco where he lived across the street from Golden Gate Park. In the park, there was a mountain of stones that him and his friends would play on most days. And he only found out later why that pile of stones was there. Now, decades before, park leaders decided to build a castle as a tourist attraction. So they went to Germany and they purchased a beautiful castle and carefully dismantled it, keeping a meticulous blueprint of the placement of every stone. Stones went into crates. They were shipped across the Atlantic, that way is it? And anyway, they got to San Francisco and they were all carefully transported to the park. However, when they went to unpack the crates, they realised they'd lost the blueprints and they were unable to rebuild the castle. All that was left was a pile of stones that were eventually used to line the flower beds. Brodia goes on to write, this story gives a picture of the body of Christ. In the scripture, there are many passages which speaks to us about the church as a building. We are living stones being built together as a spiritual house. 1 Peter 2.5 We are being, being built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11 Sadly, somehow though, we've lost the biblical blueprints. And in many ways, the church of Jesus Christ has become a pile of stones. How could this happen? In the book of Acts, the church began as an apostolic force to be reckoned with. Jesus sent us in the power of the Holy Spirit to make disciples of all nations. But over the centuries, there was a gradual shift from an apostolic foundation to a foundation based on the pastoral gift. Not that we're criticising the pastoral gift, but there was this shift in focus. What began as a dynamic body where every member was functioning fully gradually drifted into the separation of priesthood and laity. And this shift over the centuries produced a spectator church filled with spiritual consumers. Living stones that were intended to have a functional position in the house became a useless pile of stones. We need to focus on being faithful in teaching. To be teaching one another from the word in a truly transformational way. So that the church, and indeed this faith community, functions as the apostolic force to be reckoned with that God has raised it up to be. Apostolic leaders are builders. They receive the blueprint of God for what they are called to build and steward the blueprint onto completion. The second phrase that I sense to focus for this year ahead. Be dutiful in discipleship. There has to be a willingness for what is required. Now we know the church is not the building, it is the people. If we are to build the church, we are to build people. And it is the commitment, our pursuit of duty, if you like, in investing time in discipleship, which will build people in Christ. After all, once again, it was the model that Jesus used for that first group of men and women, wasn't it, who followed him? Discipleship is the apostolic work of building the kingdom of God. We see the difference between one who is an apostolic builder and one who isn't in the lives of John Wesley and George Whitfield. Both ministered at the same time in the evangelical revival in Britain in the 1700s. Both were extremely powerful preachers and Whitfield was said to have been even more powerful than Wesley. However, it was Whitfield himself who remarked that by comparison to Wesley's converts, his were like a rope of sand. He didn't mean his converts weren't soundly saved. But he saw that Wesley had not been content just to win people for Christ. 
He had organised them into cell groups and had trained them to become an army for the Lord. As a result, the Methodist movement was born and it carried on the work long after Wesley was dead. As we know, the Salvation Army comes from the roots of Methodism. Most of our doctrines came from the Methodist New Connection. That's where we come from. This activity is characteristic of truly apostolic ministry. And the cell groups mentioned, they were the small groups where the discipleship occurred. Specifically, they were aimed at teaching on holiness, on sanctification and Christian perfection. Being part of a small group is vital for our ongoing spiritual growth and discipleship. I know many of you are part of a small group, but many of us are not. For today, I'm just going to leave that thought or challenge with you for now. And apostolic leaders are mobilisers. They unite diverse members with different giftings and capacities to work together to fulfil the purposes of God. And the third phrase received for our focus for the year ahead, be courageous in community. Be consistent, compassionate, caring and considered. We'll need to unpack that a little bit more in the time ahead. But we are engaged with our community here at the Launceston Salvos. And we know that heart-to-hand service is part of the DNA of the Salvation Army and who we are. But where it comes down to being more courageous is being more explicit or known for why we do the community service that we do. It is the love of Jesus which motivates us. It is the desire to build relationship with people so we can help not just only with their temporal needs, but introduce them to Jesus who is the only one who can bring full salvation to every part of their being. You know, with the cost of living pressures that will continue to impact throughout this year, more and more people in our community are going to experience unmet physical needs. So the opportunities for engaging with people more holistically, so that includes their spiritual needs, is only going to increase, I believe. We're going to be putting that phrase of alongside others more and more to the test. You know, we're not going to be able to do all that I believe God will ask of us without additional help. We're going to need to be courageous in building relationships and partnerships with other faith communities, other churches. We're going to be courageous in our need for advertising for other volunteers where we need to. All of that. So perhaps that's a fair bit already for today as we start the new year. I hope it doesn't make you feel daunted though. I hope it does actually start to build some excitement, some passion for where God is leading, for what God is calling us to do. It's not something that can be done alone. I can't do all that. It's going to need each and every one of us to play our part. If I were to give a more specific answer to that question of Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? At this moment in time, it would be this. Lord, I want you to raise the apostolic leader level of the body of Christ amongst us so that we can fulfill the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth. I want to see the development and placement of each living stone in this faith community so we are built into the spiritual house for the kingdom of God that you see us as being. So where or whom can you train, teach, mentor, disciple? Who can you be working alongside in community as you seek to bring the light of the kingdom of God into the places where you are? Many other questions as well. That's our journey ahead for the kingdom of God this year. May we be on our knees in prayer as we start to discern that more and more. Each of us as to what that means. Be praying for myself as together I try and understand as I lead you each as to what this will mean for us. I just yearn to have a greater kingdom impact than what we yet have on our city. May we see a great flood of salvation, people's lives being changed and transformed. May we follow the true calling that God is placing on us to be all that we can be to him. We'll invite the worship team back up.
And it's in words that re- simply reflect that desire to give all that we are, all that we are to him. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. May this be not just a moment that we run through before we get to morning tea and a cup and a nice chat. It may be a significant time, once again, of commitment and rededication of our lives to the Lord. And places of prayer are always open. If you need them here at the front or wherever in this house of God, we can pray. Seek him. Seek what he asks of you. Seek what he asks of you with that question. What do you want me to do for you? Let him have complete freedom. love and compassion that you have for us. We thank you for the great goodness and blessing that you reveal to us each and every day, both in the hard and the good. You are always there. And Lord, we thank you that you are a God who challenges us, that you stand before us and question us What is it that you want? 
Lord, may we rest in you and seek you to understand what it is that you want us to see, what it is that you want us to ask, what it is that you want us to respond in what all that we want to see for the work of your kingdom. We know you never challenge us without equipping us, Lord. So we thank you in anticipation for the equipping and building that you are going to be doing amongst us this year, for the raising up that we're going to see of people, a hearts aflame for you, reignited anew for you, continuing on in passionate service for you. I feel so blessed to be part of this faith community. I thank you for each and every person here. For I know that you have placed each of them here and that each of us together have a part to play in the work that you want us to achieve. May all that we do bring glory to you, God. May we always point people to our one true source of hope and love and power. So we rest before you in confidence today, Lord, knowing that we serve a God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or dream of. We simply desire for people to come to know you and to be transformed wholly by the power of your spirit and equipped to then go and tell others of your great love. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Be with us this week. We know you shall, for you promise to be so. Amen. Let's stand and sing a reminder of how great is our God. Yeah.